Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today my guest is Lothar Schaefer. Hi Lothar. Yes. And he has written two books and one is In Search of Divine Reality, Science as a Source of Inspiration. It was written about 15 years ago. And the new book which is hot off the press is Infinite Potential, What Quantum Physics Reveals About How We Should Live Life. And we were basing most of the interview on this book, and the title gives you a fair idea of what we're going to cover. So, Lothar, you are a retired professor of physical chemistry, and in some notes I picked out one of your books, it says that you spent a large part of your life in a laboratory, and you looked at quantum chemical computations, computations and electron diffraction studies of molecular structures. Correct. Which is a bit of a mouthful Correct. for someone like me. You said perfect. I said it perfect, but I mean, I, mean, I mean what it all means is a mouthful. <laughs> but what we're going to do is we're going to try and demystify this subject. Because the whole subject of quantum science, quantum phenomena, is just very important in, for us in the view, overall view of consciousness. And you come of it very much from a scientific point of view. So... One thing you were telling me, we had some dinner together last night, and you were telling me I thought was very interesting. When you were about 18 years old, you actually were very fascinated by waves, and you also did some paintings, didn't you, which kind of foretold right. your future career. Yes. Um, human beings, in general, or many of us, wonder, is our mind only our own mind, or is it connected? And as we continue, we will say more and more that the phenomena of quantum physics teach us that our mind is not just our mind, but connected to a cosmic mind. And so when you say something like it, uh, people will say, well, can you prove it? And of course, you can't prove it in a, in a normal way by making some measurement. You can't measure the temperature of a brain and say, okay, that guy is connected, that guy is not connected. You have to, everybody has to find it in themselves. Uh, you have to prove it to yourself. I can share, I did share this event with you uh, that shows me that somehow I'm connected because the ideas that I'm talking about now and, you know, in my book, in connection with science, with scientific concepts, they already existed in me when I was a young man, but not in this way, but in some, in some symbolical way. So, for example, one of the topics is, is our mind connected? It's an ancient topic. The Indian sages already talked about it, that the cosmic spirit is in us. Uh, German idealist philosophers in the 19th century, Hegel said, if you are proud of your thinking, think twice. It isn't you who is thinking, it's a cosmic spirit who is thinking in you. So, so the, cosmic, the cosmic thinking is thinking in you. Right, that's what they that's said. That's a deep statement, isn't it? It's a deep statement, and something like this comes out of the quantum phenomena, but here's, a, here's an example, when, like you said, when I was a young man, I was painted, I also painted myself, and the paintings usually came about, I saw something and I put it on paper with pencil and then made an oil painting. Whenever I painted myself, I painted myself with like, half the face was filled with the universe, with <laughs> something. Huh. And at, the, at that time, I hadn't heard of the Indian sages, I hadn't heard of, of the implications of quantum theory, nothing. But I had this idea already, and you might think, maybe all my life I looked for this until I found it in a rational way in science. Mm. Is that...? So something in you, maybe you weren't aware of it consciously, right. something was searching and something was looking at that stage in yes. your life. It's, it's like that was part of my potential and really the potential is looking for you, it's looking for your mind. Mm. Uh, you can compare it with, there's a, a medieval Islamic 
mystic who said, uh, his name was Bestami, he said, for 30 years I've been looking for God. After that time, when I opened my, mouth, my mind, I found that God was looking for me. Mm. And it's like this, you may wonder about your potential, and then you find out, looking for it, it's really looking for you. Mm. And why is it important? It's, it's important because it's like it wants to come out. If you don't let it come out, you don't lead a happy life. M most people think when they grow up and they learn enough to have a job and make some money and eat and so on, that's it. No. You live a life just to, to the material. Look at these people. They get very, very frustrated as they get older. There is something in us. It, it's like you could say it wants to come out. It's our potential and you have to find a way to let it come out. So yeah. for me, it was, you know, the realm of forms and so on. Yeah, and, and, and you talk actually at one point in your Infinite, infinite <coughs> Potential book about how to realize that potential, it's about getting in tune. I think you used the word universe, cosmic flow, I can't remember the words you used, but it's getting in tune with what I would call the greater picture. Yeah. Um, well, why can you say is something that unexpected at all in connection with science. And the reason is that in the last century, quantum physics, it has shown us that there is a part of the world that we can't see. To the traditional science, that's completely impossible. Traditional science, I mean, you know, founded by Newton, Newton's physics is materialism. Everything is explained in terms of moving particles. As he said, the particles, God created these particles. They are hard, impenetrable, movable. They never wear or break in pieces. Nature is eternal. Particles are everything. It's materialism. Everything is explained in terms of the property of, of particles. Now, it was it immensely successful in a, in a technical way, technological way. So people began to believe in materialism, that only matter is real, nothing else. Thoughts are not real, they are just a byproduct. Um, Darwin took this materialism and entered it into biology. And from that time on, having or not having stuff is what life is about. There's nothing spiritual, nothing else. That's a, just a byproduct. Either you eat or you're eaten. And from this followed, greed and aggression are the basic virtues of life. So what you're saying is somehow as a human race we've misinterpreted the underlying truth. Yes. And we've Very taken good. it in to be separate, we're always acting as separate individuals where in fact this interconnectedness is there and we've just lost touch with it. Very good. Uh, there is this Indian concept of Maya. The, s approximately is that the visible world is Maya. It's a system of misleading messages like the commercials of a company or the statements of a government. It, it tells you something, but it also misleads you. Mm. And even the most inspire, inspired people, they were misled. For example, uh, Newton, he said, I was very proud. I have no need of hypothesis. I'm dealing with facts. And he's talking about how God created matter. How, or he said the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe. How is that a fact? Has he been everywhere hopping around and finding out that? No. So you see, the, there is an element of being misled by the triumphs of one's own discoveries. Mm. Um, that's typical and it hits all of us. Um, his idea about his dealing with facts is misleading. And so, 
Here's quantum physics. All of a sudden it says there is not only matter, there is a part of the world that is real, but it doesn't contain things, it contains forms. They are non-material, they are not energy. How come they are real? Because they can act, they can express themselves in the empirical world and act in it. They are a realm that have the nature of a potentiality. So they're non-material forms in some way. They're non-material forms. But you know, that sounds like, oh my God, you know how complicated, now the guy is going to get off the deep end and so on. No, very, very simple things you can use, like atoms, molecules, they exist in quantum states. First of all, the only way now to understand the properties of atoms and molecules is Schrodinger's mechanics. Is Schrodinger, Schrodinger. Erwin Schrodinger, yeah, okay. the Austrian physicist, who in the 20s of the last century developed this theory, is the only way to understand how atoms and molecules work. In this theory, you, you know that atoms are a nucleus of matter and around it are electrons. And you know, actually, it's, it's, it is alone very interesting that it's emptiness. This is emptiness. Well, as I understand it, it's primary, primary on the. It's primary empty. It's mainly space. Yes. But there are atoms, and the atoms interrelate to hold the, that particular yes. structure together. Yes. Very good. Um, but you know that's also interesting. The nucleus of an atom contains 99.999 percent of the entire mass but it is 10,000 times smaller than the space that an atom wants to have around it. Yes. Why? Because when another atom enters that space, there are repulsive forces. If you could take all the nuclei of all the atoms of this globe and stack them together, they would fit on a football field. Mm. And stick, but nobody would play football. So the rest is empty, it's not quite empty, the electrons are there, but in Schrodinger's mechanics, the only way to understand the electrons and the properties of atoms is to say the electrons are waves. That's why his, his mechanics is often called wave mechanics. And the thing about it is these waves, they have no units of mass or energy, they are just numbers. Okay, so I think you also call them a potentiality. The waves are a potentiality, is that correct? Yes, they are a potentiality. Um, that, that aspect, why are, are these waves potentiality? They have the potential, when you interact with it, for you to find an electron, which is a particle. Whenever you interact with an electron, it appears as a particle. Then, when you leave it alone, it flows away as a wave. So when you say you leave it alone, what does that mean practically? You don't interact with it. Okay, but you is who? Your instrument. So yeah. we're talking but about human beings. Well, no, Can just be an instrument, some other, some other form. Mechanical, mechanical thing. So if an, here's the thing, if whenever you see an electron, it is localized, it's a point it's a particle. Then, when it is in a vacuum and it doesn't interact with anything, it makes a spontaneous transition into a wave-like state, where it has lost all matter, is no more energy, the state is spread out in space, the wave is spread out in space, it spreads out more and more. You might say, what, what kind of wave is it? It's potentiality because it contains a potentiality where you can find the electron. The important point is the potentiality to find it is no longer in a specific space, it's in many spaces. Which means that a potentiality wave is not a part of the empirical world. As empirical mean the world of form. What do you mean by empirical? Empirical meaning you can see it. Okay, something tangible. Something tangible. Yeah. Because, okay, you know, I will leave here later on. 
Tomorrow somebody says to you, where's Lothar? You say, I, I don't know where he is, but I know he is somewhere. I, I cannot leave the empirical world. Being somewhere means the probability to find you is 100% there and zero everywhere. I cannot be in a state where I'm 5% here and 5% there and 5% down the street. I can't do that. No empirical object can do it. So when an electron or an atom, atoms do it, molecules do it, when they are alone, they make a transition into this wave-like state which is a state of potentiality, not actuality, because they can pop out of it somewhere. So what influences their potentiality? What influences their potentiality? Well, okay, first of all, this potentiality is non-empirical, right? It is not part of the empirical world. Okay. We can't really say what is going on in there. The, it is possible to think that all empirical phenomena come out of waves of potentiality. If there are waves, they may hang together like the waves in an ocean. Or what are these waves? Uh, good question. They are information. They are patterns of information. When you say, you see, then physicists, pioneers, they started to think, Patterns of information, information is normally meant for some, think, some mind. Whose mind? A cosmic mind? They say, no, 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 this is ridiculous, can't be. But then you find out they have the nature of potentiality. Okay? Thoughts, our thoughts have the nature of potentiality. So you're saying this is a, this, it's very similar between our mind and the structure of again, the universe. Again, yes. yes. Again, it suggests it's something thought-like. My thoughts are, you don't know it. My thoughts are real. I know it. But they are non-empirical. But they can come out, they have the potential. Okay, no, I'm not saying anything anymore. Right? No, I say something because they come out. And actually, <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice... Uh, story, St. Augustine. Already St. Augustine thought about that. There is, he reports that someday he visited some people in Rome and he talked to them and he said, all of a sudden it occurred to him, he said, this is very strange. I, I come here, I have something to say. I speak to you in Latin. If, if you were Greeks, if I was in, in in Athens, I would have to speak in Greek to you, but the thoughts are not in Latin or Greek in me. They are something completely else. They are potentiality. Mm. And so, you know, he already, he realized this. Um, I've told this, this story too often, and maybe I shouldn't tell it again, but, but he was a playboy, he was a saint, but in the first part of his life he was a playboy. Big time, I mean, dinners and vino italiano and <laughs> girlfriends, not one girlfriend, many girlfriends, and at the same time, it is more fun. But he knew, somehow he had a feeling, uh, perhaps it's not the right way to live, so he had a prayer. And it said, dear God, please let me, give, let me be a good person, but not yet today. So, you know, this is St. Augustine. But let's go back to the potentiality. Potentiality has something thought-like. So all of a sudden you discover that the background of empirical things has, is potentiality. Is it thought-like? Um, Eddington, the great British physicist, already in the 30s, you see, Science is always divided into the, into the sissies and the people who have some, some courage. Already in the 30s he had the courage to say, one day it occurred to him, he said, 
measurements in physics, they make sense because our instruments, they are connected to a background that we know. Like when you watch the movement of a light dot in the night sky, it makes sense because you know about the planets running around the sun. And he said the things with atoms is we don't know the background. It, it doesn't make sense. The atoms are like a brain. A brain has a lot of activities, but you don't know what is going on in the mind behind it by making the measurements of the electrical discharges. And he said already in the 30s, we should think the two together and say the background of atoms is mind-like. Hmm. The universe, the stuff of the universe is mind stuff. It's, as we were saying earlier, it's all about interconnectedness, isn't it? Yes. And not trying to think we're separate. Coming back, we have a base, it's a non-material base. Yes. But somehow that is always influencing us. And I like, you know, I like the subtitle of your book, What Quantum Physics Reveals About how we should live, this infinite potential we have. Let's just look briefly, how can we as human beings on a practical level start to realize our own, our infinite potential? Okay, um, if I may start with how you started. Um, how do, yeah, the concept of wholeness is important. The physicists weren't looking for that. They weren't looking for consciousness. It was, they were kind of, I like to say, nudged step by step in the direction. And all of a sudden they said, look, so if the background is mind-like, contains forms that have properties of thoughts, very likely they're hanging together like thoughts in our mind. Actually, there are medieval philosophers who already said something like it. Uh, Giordano Bruno, for example, the person who was burned on stake in the 15th century, he said, if the forms in the background of the world, if they are not coherent, think what would happen. They actualize, but they all actualize in their own way. The visible world would be chaotic, but the visible world isn't chaotic, it is lawful, it's, it's rational. So that is a sign <coughs> excuse me, that the forms in the background, they are, all, they are coherent, they, mm. they follow one mind. So there is a law, we're not aware of what the law is, but somewhere underlying there is a law. There is an order. An order. Yeah. Okay. And now you can say, if there is a mental order, and we have a mind, so somehow at one time in evolution, this order created a mind, would it make sense to think, then it left us alone? It just created mm. that mind for no reason, mm. left us alone? Mm. Doesn't make sense. And now you see, you can go to modern psychology, psychiatry. They have said the same thing. Carl Gustav Jung, you know, he was talking about the collective unconscious. There is an unconscious in us out of which forms emerge all the time into our consciousness. They guide our life. It's collective. Everybody is connected to it. Mm. It's, like a, it's like a cosmic field. Don't tell me it's made by my genes. I mean, it is so conflicting. So complex, not everything is made by the genes. So how does that influence you, Lota, in your life, knowing that? Not only understanding it, but knowing it. Well, um, this, this cosmic background, it is full of ideas, it is full of creativity, it is full of playfulness. If you learn how to touch it and communicate with it and get ideas. It's happiness. At the same time, I would say, if you don't do it, if you just live for, for eating and sleeping and whatever, 
you get frustrated because you have a tool that isn't used. And that's one thing in our own way we're all trying to do is trying to be happy. Yeah. And what you're saying is the key to the happiness is recognizing first of all and then understanding and then actually being open to an expression of the underlying order. Right. And you brought up earlier, and it's a very important point, does it tell us how we should live? You see, the classical world was segregative. The particles in, in Newton's physics, they move around. Yeah, there are some forces, but his physics had nothing to do with philosophy. Philosophy had nothing to do with the arts. And, you know, specifically one important principle was ethics has nothing to do with physics. Um, who is the British philosopher? David Hume. Right. Who right. said what is and is not the case has nothing to do with what ought and ought not to be done. Later on it was called the is ought fallacy to think that you can derive a system of ethics based on the order of the universe. But, you know, we live in this world. If we don't live in accordance with it, we will become unhappy. Yes. And, all right, the laws of physics don't tell you how you should live. However, when they tell you that the world is a wholeness, that we are all connected, then there are some simple conclusions that follow that are of a moral nature. For example, if we are all connected, to cheat someone is stupid. You cheat yourself. Yeah. To hurt someone is stupid. Yeah, maybe that minute you don't, but uh, I'm old enough, I've met lots of people who made money by cheating people and being aggressive and so on. Towards the end of their lives, they live with absolute misery. It mm. is going to get you. It, mm. That's what I think. Yeah, it just reminded me that some of the richest people in the world, the Bill Gates, etc., they are now giving back something like 95% of their, of he their wealth. He is smart. He is a wise man, yes. but others want to have more and more and more. Yes, and but I think most of them get to the point where they realize that having more and more doesn't actually make them any happier. Right. And that's one of the big keys, isn't it? Yes. If they're not happy, as you were saying, we're not really in tune with the, un the, the under underlying order. Yes. Um, and in general it is like this. If reality is a whole, if the background is a wholeness, everything comes out of it. Now, you and I, our bodies are not connected, but our roots, our, our transcendent roots, there we are connected. Mm. Um, society should be different. We, yes, the, the ethics that follows from, from Darwin is be aggressive, you know, it, it was a late justification of colonialism. If you can sail out in the world and get a few countries, man, you have to do that, because otherwise they come and get you. Something like this. Um, in contrast, if everything is connected, we should try to have a society based not on competition, but on cooperation. We should try to have a world order not based on wars, but on, on mutual support. And it is very interesting. Um, Darwin was right in many ways, but he also made errors. And, and one error was that he said, nature doesn't make jumps. Well, important stages in the evolution made jumps. And they always happened when the globe got under stress, like in an ice age. And life survived, not because different species were eating each other, but they cooperated. And you know, we should think there are no signs that the world is getting under stress again, big time. 
at that time physics discovers the wholeness, the world globalizes as a wholeness, maybe these are the signs that we are making a jump into a new species, into a new human being or a new mind. And that's what is needed. And it is not an aggressive mind. What do you think? Is it? Personally, I think that we have, there's two ways we can go. One is very much, for me, what you're saying, which is really it's common sense, really, comes down to it. It's a greater understanding which brings common sense, and common sense brings common actions. Yeah. Or we can go the madness of separation, and as you're saying, aggression and everything else, and then we destroy ourselves. But I'm interested in just going, in a way it's going back a stage, but something that's talked about more and more we hear now is non-locality which is a very, a very quantum physics phrase. Just explain as, as, as clearly as you can how non-locality fits in with the picture. Um, the, the technical term is, is somewhat difficult to do in a few minutes. But non-locality means things are connected. In other words, if, if the background is a realm of forms, they're all connected, we are connected in this background with us. I mean, things are, yeah, actually, you can say, um, we talked about earlier, particles or atoms, when you leave them alone, they, they leave the empirical world become waves. So, um, why is this table not leaving the world become a wave? Because the particles in there are interacting. Atoms and elementary particles do this only, so to speak, when they are left alone, when there are few interactions or none with other things. Reality, visible reality, is a, is a cooperative effect. That is that's strange. In other words, if you take each atom out of here, put it in isolation, it vanishes. Right. Um, Many people have talked about it, we don't have to talk about it. They call it wave-particle duality. It's a wrong term, there is no duality. It's like at one time you have a particle, so in a vacuum, all of a sudden, it's a wave. One time it's empirical, then it is non-empirical. It makes a transition from an empirical particle state to a non-empirical wave state. It's like you have liquid water and you have ice. It freezes. You don't speak about the water duality. No, it's stupid. And so there's not wave particle duality. No. There's one entity, you know, so I call it an entity, and it has a wave state, it has a particle state. That's how you have to look at it. And the wave states, they are connected. Like I said, the, if they were not connected, they would create a chaotic empirical world. But the world is lawful. And there, oh yes, there's so many things. Here's something else. Everything in this empirical world is lawful. Nothing happens without a cause. But at the quantum level, that is not so. A single quantum jump is unpredictable, is not caused by anything that we know. A particle may jump into another state or it may not. If it needs a photon, it can interact with a photon. Maybe it jumps, maybe it doesn't. Those are the only examples of non-lawful processes, and you know, they occur at the boundary between the empirical world and the non-empirical world. It is like something is going on here that affects it, but since we don't know it, to us it's random. Hmm. So, when biologists say that evol you know, evolution and, and mutations, mutations must have a cause, or they don't happen. No. 
when gene molecule, yeah, see biologists, they say quantum physics has nothing to do with biology. What a nonsense. I'm sorry, you, sometimes you have to be clear. Like, they say, yeah, yeah, the, the molecules of biology, they are too big. They're not quantum systems. You cut yourself, you see the red blood. Why is it red? The hemoglobin in there is a huge molecule. It's like 30,000 times heavier than a hydrogen atom. It is red because it can absorb only certain frequencies or energy quanta out of visible light, and you see what is left over. To absorb quanta means it has to go from one quantum state to another, this huge molecule. You can't say, oh, no, that's not a quantum process. And so the same about, uh, about mutations. Dawkins says, mutations are caused by something. They don't just randomly happen. No. Mutation is a chemical reaction. In a chemical reaction, a molecule makes transitions between quantum states. They may occur, they may not occur. You cannot predict them. Also, when a system makes a transition to another state, it leaves for a short time the empirical world. Why? When a molecule goes from one state to another, it has to go through a transition state where it exists in both states at the same time. I have a simple example. Say you are going on a highway, you travel north, and then say you want to go south. What do you have to do? You are not a quantum car. Your car is, I've been in your car. It's <laughs> I haven't got a quantum car yet, no. no. First you have to go east, you know, leave the highway. Then you have to turn west, go over the highway, and then you can turn south. No. Molecules don't do this. They're moving north. All of a sudden, bingo, they're going south. You don't see anything in between because they go through a superposition state for a short time, they are kind of, in both states, they, they go both north and south at the same time, not really, but in this non-empirical world, and then they pop out somewhere. And here's the important consequence of this. Constantly, all the molecules and atoms in your body, they are making state transitions. Every time they make a transition between a vibrational, rotational, electronic state, they blink out of the empirical world. What is happening to them, what kind of information is getting to them in that short time, you don't know. When a gene molecule blinks out of the empirical world, you don't know what can happen. So, is this what, when, when people appear to have spontaneous healings, is this what is happening? The quantum world is coming in and that's what their, their body is doing? It may be more complex. I would maybe not call it the quantum world, but, but the, the non-empirical background is... Yes. Yeah. But so yes. so on, on the form level, the form level becomes less solid and somehow the background is more coming to the foreground and then something changes. In the, in the, is that right or am I oversimplifying it? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's not less solid, it's <coughs> something becomes for a short time maybe non-empirical, you know. Yes. So, but the important consequence when biologists say, for example, life evolves out of nothing. I'm sorry, nothing comes out of nothing. Molecules can only jump in states that already exist in them. They are empty, so you don't see them. They are part of this non-empirical world. They can't jump into nothing. They can only actualize forms of potentiality that are already in them. So to say, life comes out of nothing, go ahead, make my day, fine. But it, it's, it's nonsense. The I'm just reading one of the quotes from one of your books here, Lota. The line of offence that led to the evolution of human beings is so unlikely, dependent so much on incredible contingencies, and our existence is so unpredictable, 
make a slight change in one of these universal constants and our metabolism will break down. If you were to change somehow the constants of our world, like let's say the ratio between the masses of an electron and a proton, uh, if you would change some of the constants, like gravitational constants, just a little bit, the universe as we know it couldn't exist. It's fine-tuned. Yes. Yes. And that fine-tuning, is that a mystery or is that explainable in your world? No, well, actually, you know, I haven't thought so much about it. I would say um, the way we have been following, you can perhaps not do everything. You could say, well, if there is a mind behind everything and you wanted this manifested world, so the, the constants fit too, so that you know things are working. But, but that goes a little bit uh, out of the general context. Okay. We can directly experience. Yes. We cannot really experience these constants. We can experience our mind. Yeah. Well, let's go back again because that's something that, 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 that interested me. You said you were saying right at the beginning that <coughs> the universe has a mind, we have a mind, there's information in the universe, there's information in our mind. And you talk, you talk again at the end, towards the end of the Infinite Potential book, you talk about how we need to clear our minds. We have all this information that we've been downloading, from every experience in our life and all the things we've learned and happened to us. Yes. And we're, we're full, aren't we? Our minds are full of information. Yes, and also full of, of biases that come from the time, you know, when we grew up and people taught us things. But biases also um, caused by our language. You know, um, we talked about, actually yesterday, how language can be a brainwash. Like in, in the English language, reality, okay, something is real. Where does the word come from? Comes from the Latin word res, things. Things are real. There is really no other word for real in the English language. In German, there are two words. One is the same, Realität, is the same, comes from the Latin word res. And the other one is Wirklichkeit. It comes from wirken, from acting. If it can act on you, it is real, even when it is not material. I think at one time the English word actuality was but it lost the meaning of reality. You can't say, you know, I think about the nature of reality and then you say, let's talk about the nature of actuality. It isn't that general thing anymore. Um, there are many others, like, what do you say when something is empty? There's nothing there. Right. You know what you said? There is no thing there. It's vacant. It's <laughs> there's no thing. Yes. There's no thing. It's empty. Yeah. What if it isn't empty but there are invisible forms? Yes. No, yes. There are uh, nothing. Well, there's nothing that we can see. No, it's nothing important. That's what your language says. Yes. Okay. You see? And so I think it is not an accident that in the English language range, where there's only basically one word for being real, comes from mass, England has produced the most powerful and most successful formulations of materialism. Darwin, Newton, <clears throat> the banking system, and so on. In the German language range, where there is a word for 
for real that has nothing to do with things, but with something that acts on you, some of the most powerful formulations of idealism emerged. The 19th century idealism, 18th, 19th century idealism with, with Kant and Hegel, and quantum physics. Quantum physics is a form of idealism to the extent that it says things are connected, quantum physics is a form of mysticism. You should think about it, not say, how stupid, no, just think about it. It tells us the world is connected. Mystics of all ages told us we are connected with some ultimate world. There, it's not exactly the same, but you see, there is this phenomenon, perennial philosophy. I'm sure you must have heard about it. Philosophia perennis. Uh, like many of these things, they come out of the Indian, from the Indian sages thousands of years ago. I think they call it Sanatana Dharma. There are truths that are so basic they are so fundamental that they constantly come back again and again in different people at different times, different parts of the world. Like mysticism. Yes, there were the medieval mystics. And now there's quantum physics. Molecules, atoms, they have empty states. You know, they exist in quantum states. You can think like a hydrogen atom, you can think of like a, like a steps of a ladder, nearly infinitely many. Each step is determined by a quantum number. It's called a quantum number. It, it determines a fixed amount of energy, a quantum of energy. It's a quantum state. The atom stands in one of these steps. Each step has a certain amount of energy and a certain form, a waveform, that determines its properties. So it's like you, when you want to climb on top of your house, you take a ladder and you go from step to step, you don't stay in between. Well, I don't, I can't. So, molecules, atoms are like this, they have to stay on one of these steps. Then the others are empty. Their forms exist, but you can't see them. There's nothing there to see. But their forms, they are predetermined. They depend on the condition of the system. A system can jump into this, then you see this form, then the previous one is gone. So, the, the, the chemists call these states virtual states. You know who invented that that term in the 13th century Meister Eckhart, a German mystic, he said the existence of things in their empirical existence is out of the virtual existence in God. He invented that term. Mm. It came back in quantum chemistry and I don't believe the quantum chemist who invented it they went back and said, what did Meister Eckhart say about it? Yeah. It shows how the most unusual concepts, they come back and come back. They come back because they're real. Yes, and they exist in a cosmic mind. Yes. yes. The ideas of waves, wave mechanics. Yes. The I'm visible world is created out of a realm of waves. I mean, that's molecules make jumps. Molecules meet and mix their waves, make a new molecule. We cannot in any other way physically now explain this process. Two atoms meet, the wave functions begin to mix, they find out, no, sorry, we can't get anywhere. Or they find out, yes, we can make a more stable state. So the visible world comes out of a realm of, of waves. Whose idea? That's the important point. The Indian sages, Kashmir Shaivism, they said the universe is filled with waves. 
They are throbs in the divine. They are a sign of the creativity of the universe. The visible world comes out of these waves. Okay, um, Luther, we've got about five minutes left. I want to try and kind of get it down to as much practical help, not help's not the right word, but some practical advice, suggestions that we can give to people because it makes a lot of sense what you're saying in terms of how, how science and philosophy are, are, are meeting. They both in a way have the same principles. We're all connected. The underlying non-material base is very much the ground of our being, as I would say in my language. And, and, and I, I, you know, when I asked you before about how our minds are in terms of we're downloading all this information through experience, how can we take where we are now and start practically to move towards our infinite potential? Yes, the, okay, that is an excellent question and an excellent point to finish. All this makes sense only or is important only because it can improve our life. Because we all want to be happy, absolutely. We want to be on happy. On human level, we want to be happy. We want to make others happy. Yeah. Then you say, so, okay, well, that's great, so I have to get a PhD in quantum physics. No, I, I'm not now saying it to push my book, but you can describe and read the phenomena that physicists call quantum phenomena at a level where you understand completely the essence without any mathematics. So the understanding of quantum physics is very important. It's very important. Yes. The only thing is it has to be presented to you in the right way. And okay, many people already have told me that you know this second book, now they, that now they can read it. And I'm, I'm grateful to Deepak Chopra because he actually taught me how to not be too abstract in, in writing abstract and things. And he wrote the introduction for your book as well. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you, can, you, must, you must want to learn. You can't just say, okay. okay, you know, I learned enough to make money and so on. Fine, you go ahead, do it. If that works, it's fine. You have to understand what the world is like what the universe is like, to understand your position in it, and then live in accordance with it. That is the best way. The important point is that now we find out the way the universe is, is not visible at the surface only. No, it has a hidden form. But we can say something meaningful about it that, that gives, us, gives us guidance. And when you live in accordance with it, you get happy. When you find out that you can make contact with your own potential, the ideas will start flowing into your mind and, and make you happy. Being creative is the greatest way to be happy. You know it because your interviews are creative. Sometimes but they're not, not so good. People I have are not to be quiet sometimes as well. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's a balance of being creative, creative and, being, <laughs> and being quiet and doing yeah. other things as well, yeah. It was a challenge for me to read your books, but I enjoyed them. They raised a lot of questions. I understood things a bit more, but it's, it's, not, an, it's not easy for people who are uninitiated in the world of the, the quantum world to to grasp it, but you, you, I do agree in, in the latest book, the uh, Infinite Potential book, you have made it as simple as possible. Part of the problem is that we have been brainwashed by growing up, and sometimes I say, you know, if you want to know, download everything is in your mind, put it in a box, throw the box away, start over. Well, I think the starting over is probably, as you say, to understand the quantum element and my feeling is people get that understanding in different ways and people with strong minds, this book is probably very valuable, I have to say. So I'm going to thank, I'm going to thank you first of all, Lothar, we need to finish now, for coming along. To thank you for having me. Chat with me here on Conscious TV. I'm going to show both your books, In Search of Divine Reality, and the latest one, 
infinite potential. And thank you very much for, again, for watching Conscious TV, and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you.